Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. I'm your host, Hannah Zaberi, and you're watching us on Muslim Network TV, America's only Muslim-focused TV channel. You can watch us 24-7 on Galaxy 19 satellite, Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and various social media websites. After a mob of Trump supporters, most of um, some of them who were armed, um, besieged and then ransacked the Capitol a few weeks ago, many contrasted the response of the law enforcement um, to that of mostly uh, white uh, rioters with the brutal crackdown, police crackdown on uh, Black Lives Matter protests. And others observed that if any time this would have been a Muslim um, or Muslims have e even contemplated uh, such an act, they would have been branded as terrorists. And it would have been, and, and many of the people who were commenting um, as such on social media websites, um, the, you can't blame them. You know, it was a very sharp contrast. Uh, and there were several memes floating around on, um, you know, our WhatsApp groups. But Let's um, let's but you know let's take a deeper look at this. Um, do black uh, people and black Muslims, mus generally Muslims in the United States, we all know that we're over policed. We've heard it from our communities. Um, people when they come on the show, several people have spoken about their personal experiences, um, and most of this policing is done under the guise of public safety. So today I wanted to talk to somebody who's really an expert on this topic as he's uh, fought many cases um, across the country, uh, working for Council of Islamic American Relations, uh, American Islamic Relations CARE, uh, the Muslim community's largest civil rights uh, organization. Uh, Ghadir Abbas is the attorney uh, for CARE. He's spearheaded major lawsuits across the country involving constitutional issues um, and of particular concern to the American Muslim community, including the successful challenge to Oklahoma State's Question 755, a voter-approved referendum that would bar references to Islamic religious traditions in uh, Oklahoma courts. Um, he's also led, uh, le litigated on behalf of American Muslims surveilled by GPS tracking without warrants um, based on the federal government's terrorist watch list and prevented, uh, you know, our community, when our communities are have been prevented from building schools or mosques by discriminatory zoning laws. And we've discussed many of those topics here on the show. So I am... Um, so honored to welcome Gadir on this uh, on the show and have a robust uh, conversation about the aftermath of um, what happened on Capitol Hill, domestic terrorism, and how what are the implications for Black and Brown communities? Thank you so much, Gadir. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks for having me. So, um, I you know let's. What did you see? What were you? What were your thoughts watching uh, what unfolded on January sixth at the Capitol? Well, you know, I couldn't help but feel baffled that the billions and billions of dollars that we spend on police, on law enforcement, on the military, couldn't stop a few thousand people. Um, upset at um, Joe Biden's election to the presidency from storming the Capitol building during uh, the um, Senate's uh, ratification of the electoral college results. And, you know, it was, like you said, the, the contrast um, from, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and uprisings that happened in the summer all across the country where you'd regularly see the police outnumber the protesters. Um, uh, and here, you know, the nation's capital building at a particularly uh, vulnerable uh, point, doing something absolutely critical to the transfer of power, um, just, you know, calling it in uh, and uh, letting, uh, 
you know, a bunch of hooligans um, uh, ransacked the Capitol building uh, in front of everybody's eyes. And so, uh, you know, that was that was that was that was what I took away <laughs> from the day's events. Definitely. Yes, it was a shock. I mean, um, all, both of us have been at the Capitol. There's security. There's just seeing the difference in how I, I, it was flabbergasting. Uh, I was that flabbergasted because I cannot imagine for a minute uh, that this if that had this had been a crowd of dreamers or if it had been a crowd of uh, any other constituency uh, that they would have been treated in the same manner, especially something so well planned where they had T-shirts and nooses hanging outside. It was just something out of a the twilight zone. But it wasn't. It was real. And it was these were also citizens of our country who felt this way and felt the privilege of entering our Capitol uh, building and being able to brandish, um, you know, I, I remember so many protests where you, you were not allowed to even bring in um, a, a stick to hold up your poster. Your posters had to be in your hands. So all those rules seem to have like been thrown out of the window. Um, but I um, wanted to talk about the implications of this uh, insurrection and um, how it shines a light uh, not only on the way the police treat different groups of people, uh, but also on the way they label threats. How is this affecting the way people view the right to assemble? Well, I think that the, you know, it was a very traumatic uh, episode for a lot of people, a symbol of our country, of our history, of our collective um, uh, um, uh, experience, you know, attacked. And I think that everybody felt the, the trauma of that. But in the wake of that trauma, I think that the reaction has been that, you know, we really can take a technological approach to dissuading these folks from assembling, from um, uh, organizing. And that's why, you, you know, in the aftermath of lawlessness at the Capitol building, you have, you know, Silicon Valley companies um, uniting to, you know, close parlor down, you know, uh, an entire social media platform just, you know, burned to the ground, you know, in a, you know, in a couple days in reaction. And it turned out that most of the organizing that took place um, in advance of January 6th was done in plain view and on Facebook, not on parlor or elsewhere. It was done on Facebook. And so I think that you see a lot of folks um, uh, taking advantage of the trauma to legitimize their own be bad behavior, you know, in the, in the wake of January 6th, you know, calls to, you know, Senator Chuck Schumer, now Majority Leader Schumer is, you know, calling on people to, uh, all these people to be placed on a watch list. Well, you know what? If they were on the watch list, it wouldn't have stopped them from ransacking the Capitol building in the first place. And that's Chuck Schumer's response to every bad thing that happens ever is, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden is raided um, and, and he's killed. Uh, and they, they mention uh, railroads and trains and some documents that get collected. You know, Chuck Schumer wants a no ride list, you know, forget about the no fly list. Let's create a list of people that aren't allowed to board trains. And, you know, I think that this entire, this huge, huge security apparatus, you know, just uh, days before, you know, just around January 6th, you know, so almost uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars, $750 billion gets approved um, uh, for, the, for the military. You know, tens of billions of dollars, you know, spent, on the FBI and other, you know, domestic law enforcement entities. And out of all of that, we can't even stop uh, a bunch of idiots, you know, from uh, uh, breaking into the Capitol building and shutting down an essential function of government. It was the final step, the final ceremonial step to, um, uh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, label uh, Joe Biden as the winner of the election. And we can't even do that. And so the answer is not additional police power, additional police dollars. 
it's uh, there's like a shortcoming that doesn't have to do with the resources that are allocated for those kinds of things. Definitely. Um, and you've you've uh, spoken before about terrorist watch lists and brought the suit, uh, arguing their lack of constitutionality off the list itself. Um, you know, and we we saw uh, that very very viral viral video of that young uh, white man who was not allowed to board the plane and um, and how this was ruining his life. And you've seen many many uh, Muslim lives, Arab lives. Uh, being ruined by being placed on these terror watch lists. Um, are people starting to see it differently now that a different demographic of people, like do you think the mainstream America is taking a look at this and saying, hey, uh, even though this was happening to this particular community, now that it's happening to this, uh, the you know, the majority, uh, representatives of the majority, um, this is not, this is, uh, not acceptable, and um, this should not be occurring. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard that um, thought expressed, you know, a lot that, you know, now that, you know, white Trump supporters may find themselves on watch lists, that's going to do more than anything else to delegitimize the watch list. But, you, you know, although George W. Bush is the president that created the watch list, it was a minor um, uh, program uh, of uh, limited scope, uh, you know, during the Bush years. It really wasn't until after um, Obama became president and after the underwear bomber um, uh, tried to detonate a device uh, on Christmas Day mm -hmm. over Detroit, I think this was um, in 2009, that the watch list exploded. And, and so I think that, you know, here the watch list presents liberals the idea that, you know, we can make use of this, you know, counterterrorism tool against people that we're more afraid of. And so I think rather than, um, I think that, that we're getting so far away from 9-11, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, terrorism is extremely rare um, and mm -hmm. it's been getting more rare in uh, in recent years. And, you know, we're 20 years past 9-11. And I think that this latest attempt to um, uh, find a new, new target uh, for the watch list is an attempt by, you know, security state to re-entrench themselves, give themselves a new mission um, to legitimize what has mm -hmm. been really a failed enterprise. You know, for 20 years, um, we've been putting people on watch lists. And every time there's a terrorism incident, every time there's an act of violence, you know, the question gets asked, uh, was this person on the watch list? Watch list? And every single time, every single time, the answer is no. The answer is that this person committed the act of terrorism, Pulse nightclub shooter, the Times Square bomber, um, uh, Najib Olazazi in Colorado, whoever it was that was trying to commit an act of violence or did, wasn't on the watch list when they did so. And so I, my fear is that January 6th, instead of shaking us from this 20 year slumber of 9-11 you know, induced you know, security state hysteria, will just compel us to find a new mission for what has been for two decades now a failed project. This is, uh, and when you say this, let's let's just to remind uh, our viewers, some of them who are in rural America who might not know what the Muslim community has gone through because of these watch lists. Could you tell us how many um, Muslims have been placed on these watch lists? How big are these watch lists and what kind of havoc have they created in people's lives? Yeah. So in 2003, um, and after the 9-11 Commission, which was a congressional commission that looked into um, what happened on 9-11, any security failures that occurred and proposed a set of recommendations, um, one of the recommendations they proposed is additional information sharing between agencies. And so George W. Bush issued an executive order, HSPB-6, to create a single federal government-wide watch list of what came to be known as 
as, and labeled as, you know, people that are known or suspected terrorists. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, for a few years, it was really ad hoc and informal, informal, so informal, in fact, that in the mid 2000s, I think 2006, 2007, 60 Minutes got an entire copy of the whole watch list and it had a couple mm-hmm. hundred thousand names on it. And some of the names were Nelson Mandela, you know, Ted Kennedy, you know, Evo Morales, you know, world leaders, activists in other countries. You know, Nelson Mandela was on the watch list because, you know, he was associated with the ANC, mm. um, which was, you know, which the government apparently considered, you know, a terrorist organization. And, uh, you know, and then there was some embarrassment from the federal government um, uh, in the wake of that. Um, 60 Minutes um, uh, airing, you know, some parts of the entire watch list. And so you saw it shrink in size. But Obama became president. And then the response to the underwear bomber was we need to explode the size of the watch list. And so Mm -hmm. now, you know, 20 years later, there's about 1.2 million individuals on the watch list. The watch Mm -hmm. list is shared with more than 60 foreign countries, including you know, human rights abusers like Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, um, uh, China, you know, all all these countries are getting the watches. Imagine being a Uyghur Muslim American and finding yourself, you know, on the watch list and and, and knowing that China is getting a copy. More than 500 private entities, you know, you're talking for-profit public, you know, corporations have access to the watch list. More and the children on this. I'm sorry. And their children on this watch list as well. There are children on the watch list. You know, there's people who, um, when they go through screening at the airport, um, they'll get pulled aside, and their children's diapers will be patted down. You know, individually, the one they're they're wearing, and so it, it is. It's this like technological approach to um, a uh, security issue of. Um, uh, that doesn't pose a, a great risk um, to Americans. Uh, thankfully, terrorism is very rare. And what we have to show for you know 20 years of watch listing is not a single terrorism incident has been stopped. And you know I think it obfuscates what really is you know the most important security uh, uh, reform after 9/11 is also the simplest. It's locks on cabin doors, on cockpit doors. You know, that locks on cockpit doors probably would have stopped 9-11 from happening. After 9-11, they put those locks in. But they, you know, there's a bit of theater that goes along with governing. And I think that, unfortunately, some people feel better when a minority loses rights. And that's been the Muslim community now. But it looks like it might change in the future. Um, so Ramzi Qasim, uh, also with uh, Sunni, um, uh, or um, CUNY, uh, writes that vesting more money and power in law enforcement could only ex- exasperate the problem of prejudice in policing. It would be the opposite of what millions of Americans called for this year when they took to the streets nationwide demanding that police be defunded and it would expand an already sprawling national security apparatus that must instead be diminished. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's exactly right. You know, the underwear bomber is a great example. Mm-hmm. The underwear bomber's father begged the federal government to put the child, his child on the no-fly list, warned the federal government about his concerns about um, that, you know, his child might do something uh, violent against the government. But because the FBI has taken this bulk indiscriminate approach to policing, we're gonna surveil the Muslim community, we're gonna install a network of 15,000 informants across the country, create a watch list of more than a million people. It's really impossible for the FBI to um, uh, act in response to good information that it receives. And, uh, you know, that's what we see time and time again, you know, Pulse nightclub um, shooter. Um, there were, uh, you know, that, that, that guy was, um, uh, you know, in the FBI's attention prior to um, uh, his massacre. The Chelsea bomber in New Jersey 
the father reported the son to the FBI uh, years before the bombing. And so I think that if, F, if, if law enforcement has reason to believe that someone's committing a crime, they should investigate it. Mm-hmm. And if they find evidence of criminal wrongdoing, they should prosecute it, mm-hmm. which is what they do. But this idea that we're going to hoover up and be omnipotent and, uh, and just surveil everybody all the time um, has been a fool's errand and more money, uh, more manpower is not going to fix it. So um, Republican uh, Ruben, uh, Representative Ruben Callet, though, in an interview, so he, he, rep, uh, he related what he saw as it was playing out in the Capitol to insurgencies around the, uh, around the world. He said that, um, you know, I, I've, I've been in combat and scarier than what I saw, but it was still very frightening. And then he goes on to say that um, we know that these um, militias are all over the world and we have now have them in the United States and we have the be- world's best intelligence systems in this country and we need to gear them to actually tracking down and destroying all of these domestic terror networks that we have allowed to fester in these past four years. So um, how do and we do know that DHS has issued a terrorism advisory bulletin with a variety of reasons to suspect terror attacks, uh, including anger over COVID 19 restrictions, the 2020 election results, and police use of force. So, um, how do you think, keeping this in mind, how do you think that domestic terrorism is going to be uh, the focus of DHS? How is it going? What are you seeing uh, it play out? Is um, and uh, so let's talk about that. And then I have a few questions more about security. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, this focus on domestic terrorism is going to yield you know, no results other than to uh, justify you know, the, these huge budgets um, that you know, can't even stop you know, a couple thousand people from ransacking the Capitol mm-hmm. building. I, you know, we don't have, the United States does not have the best intelligence system in the world. We have the most expensive intelligence system. Perhaps we have the most technologically sophisticated intelligence system. Um, but these folks, an intelligence system that can't discern that people openly planning to ransack the Capitol building might warrant, you know, um, some additional police presence at the Capitol building is not, is, is not an intelligence system that's doing a, a good job. And I think that's, you know, that's been the case, you know, time and time again, that, you know, DHS, which is, again, a sprawling bureaucracy, covers everything from, you know, we're going to approve your immigration application to we're going to give you, you know, a tent if your house is, you know, overrun by a hurricane and everything in between, you know, this huge, you know, billions and billions of dollar a year bureaucracy needs to have a justification. It needs to have a reason that warrants all the billions and billions of dollars that we spend. And I think there is a growing concern uh, in some quarters among the threat of, you know, white supremacy of these militia groups, of you know former um, you know like Trump supporters, um, organizing and committing acts of violence, when you know in reality, people that commit crimes should be charged with crimes and they should be sent to prison. Um, and people who are talking about um, uh, paranoid things or conspiratorial things and not doing anything about it, you know, should be left alone. And mm-hmm. certainly, like the way the the history of uh, violence against, of state violence against, you know, right-wing groups or, um, or call groups. You have the Ruby Ridge incident, you have Dave Koresh, you know, you're talking dozens of people killed um, by, uh, you know, the Clinton administration. And, uh, uh, you know, and that becomes part of right-wing folklore uh, about, you know, how the state needs to be countered. And so, you know, I don't think that the answer to, you know, our, our, our difficulties is in being more oppressive, um, uh, have a, a, a greater surveillance system or uh, target that surveillance system against others. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm skeptical. I'm really skeptical. Call me skeptical that the the surveillance and police system will actually be aimed at these white supremacist groups. I think that in the end, uh, while there will be some lip service paid and you some mild um, reports issued about white nationalist violence, that really and truly um, the the any increased surveillance, any increased police powers will inevitably be turned against the Muslim community. Yeah. And this is this is something that is definitely that uh, uh, many times as we talk about CVE programming and there's been this is not a new conversation right when that people have said eh, we should have CVE programs for domestic terrorists or white nationalists um, and this is this is something that a lot of experts in the Muslim community who have seen uh, the facts of this have said that this is a failed system this is something that uh, it doesn't identify extremists. It doesn't, you know, that's whole, um, uh, that, um, the, uh, what is that called when, uh, that th- these are signs and then you be, you know, uh, I can't remember, I'm uh, losing the terminology right now, but um, this is something the progression that, towards but, Yes, pro- exactly. The, the, um, Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, we've seen that it doesn't work. It doesn't work in any sort of extremist uh, groups. There are no signs to how someone would become an extremist in any, uh, uh, there's no science to it, despite very large budgets in universities studying this. Um, so what are your thoughts on on uh, using counter-violence extre- extreme uh, techniques against um, white nationalist groups or after this, but particularly in, um, you know, infiltration versus, um, you know, infiltrating these groups and uh, using community engagement and connection. Yeah, you know, if, you know, if, if the FBI takes, you know, the approach they've used in the Muslim community often where they isolate some mentally ill or like marginalized um, person, you know, that doesn't have a lot that's vulnerable, a lot of different ways, socially, mentally, emotionally, surrounds that person. FBI agents pumps that person full of delusions of grandeur, and then has that person, you know, um, uh, do something illegal uh, with an FBI agent, you know, pretending to be a white nationalist. I'm sure they'll be successful. I'm sure are many entrapment plots that the FBI could um, foment inside white nationalist groups, you know, with, um, with great effect Mm -hmm. um, in in terms of the theatrics. But, you know, the problem that we have is, you know, it's like a problem of alienation. You know, there's plenty of people that look at the political landscape and don't see themselves at all, you know, don't see their interests in either political party. And you have, you know, uh, you have rise rates of um, uh, diseases of despair, you know, suicide rates are increasing across the board, especially, you know, during the pandemic. Um, And so, you know, I think that these, you know, these white supremacist groups, these white nationalists, yeah, you know, they're racist. Yeah, they have um, uh, a terrible message, but I think they're they're blooming in a climate uh, th- that is desolate. Uh, there's not much. There's not a lot of hope for a lot of people that things are going to get better. Um, and so I think that the nihilism of Trump, uh, where we're just going to burn it all down, we're going to be disrespectful to everybody, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, all the time and rude to entrench you know, um, uh, powers that be, um, that, that, that can appear. I think that, you know, here the answer is difficult. It, it's, it's probably to have a more credible, responsive political system that takes care of people, that meets people where they are, rather than the technocratic approach. We're going to excise the problem by surveilling and criminalizing association and and uh, deplatforming certain kinds of speech, you know those efforts are. I think the 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 only place that those efforts are going to lead 
is to um, uh, minority groups, you know, Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter activists, Muslim community, uh, you know, dreamers being booted off of Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and you know, Instagram and everything else. Um, and, you know, the, the stage will be left, uh, uh, you know, Marco Rubio and, um, uh, you know, other, um, uh, uh, you know, folks that, you know, traffic in the uh, polite bigotry that mm. passes as acceptable political discourse in the 21st century. Sure. Thank you so much. Our time is up, but we're so grateful for you to be here. As our audience can see that uh, the work, the the efforts that have been put um, against the Muslim community. We were the canary in the coal mine, and these um, again the surveillance, the terror watch list. They haven't really been successful. So, so using these defunct tech tactics again on the wider community is not something that many Muslim experts um, are. Uh, asking for at all. We don't want what has happened to our community to happen to others um, because precisely of this reason, innocent people get caught up in uh, this dragnet and lives are destroyed. So thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.